Aloha and good morning. It's a beautiful day today that the Lord has blessed us with. I am encouraged by your presence here as we um, study the word of God. And then uh, after our Bible study, go into uh, worshiping him in spirit and in truth. Welcome to our visitors uh, know that you are an encouragement to us here. Um, thank you for choosing to be with us this morning. And I'm sure that we will be having more visitors uh, when we uh, get to the uh, hour of worship. Before we get to our Bible study uh, for our visitors uh, who may not know, um, we we do this thing as a congregation, as individuals, and as a congregation uh, where we use bookmarks, and these are available in the back table if you want one. Uh, and what we do with the bookmark is we write 10 names of people that, that we like to see obey the gospel, right? People that we know, people that are in the, our circle of influence that we want to reach and, and we want them to be saved in Christ Jesus. And so we write their names here and then we make an effort to reach them. And part of, of that effort is prayer. And every time we see this bookmark, we want to pray for it. And so in every Bible class on Sunday, I always lead us in, in a prayer uh, over these names. So if you have your bookmark, um, as I lead us in a in a in a prayer, remember those names in your mind, in your heart, and always make that effort. Be conscientious of the opportunities that can come up uh, where you can reach those souls and utilize those opportunities. Um, but let's uh, pray together uh, for the names that are on our bookmarks. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much, Lord, for another day in life, for blessing us, Father, with the health and strength, the ability, Lord, to be able to gather here as your people, to learn more from your holy word, and to worship you in spirit and in truth. Thank you so much, Father, for the many blessings you bestowed upon us, our, our jobs, our, our the food that we have, our clothing, water, the shelter over our heads. Everything that we have, Lord, we get from you. And we thank you so much, Father, for being so generous towards us and blessing us with all the good gifts. And most of all, Father, we thank you so much for Jesus and the hope of heaven that we have because of him. And we are thankful, Father, for all the souls that, that were influential in our lives that help us, Lord, to to walk the straight and narrow path that help us to understand your will and to obey your gospel, Lord. We pray a blessing upon them all. And also, Father, we pray that, that we will be like them, the people that help us see Christ, that we will do the same for others. And we pray for every single name of our on our bookmarks, Lord, that you give us the wisdom and the knowledge, uh, the tactfulness and the opportunity lord to reach the souls on our bookmark help us to realize father that that you have called us to to do this uh to preach your word uh to the lost souls in this world and so father we pray for every single one on our bookmarks lord that you give them the time they need and the opportunity for them to come to the knowledge of the truth and that you use us, Lord, as vessels in your hands to do your work and your will for your glory. Be with us now, Father, as we learn more of your holy will. Help us, Father, to apply the things we learn in our lives, to walk by them, and then to share it with others. Father, please be with those of our church family that cannot be with us today. Whatever the circumstances may be, Lord, please... Uh, bless them, Father, and, and bring them back to us in the next appointed time. Thank you so much, Lord, for this avenue of prayer where we can talk to you and make known what's on our hearts, what's on our minds. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. 
Then you take your bookmark and you put it right in your Bible. Today's class will be, uh, currently we've been studying the book of Acts, uh, but uh, I decided to uh, uh, take a, a side track here in, in the study of repentance and forgiveness. And so today's class will be uh, the last part of this study and uh, really appreciate the, the comments and questions and and you helping reading the text that we have been examining from the word of God. And the main point of emphasis uh, that, that we looked at is this point, repentance is a prerequisite to forgiveness. Um, it's especially true in our relationship with our father in heaven, that without a penitent heart, a, a heart of contrition, there would be no forgiveness uh, for us. And several of the texts, I won't elaborate on these because we already elaborated on them. So I'm going to speed right through this summary real quick for us and get to where we, we were last time. Uh, we looked at Luke chapter 17, verse three and four, uh, emphasizing in our study, the big two letter word, the word if, and how, you know, uh, forgiveness is contingent, right? It's, it's dependent on this Big if, if there is repentance. And Jesus said that if your brother sins against you, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. Uh, and then also in Matthew chapter 18, 15 through 17, uh, that's in the, the, the context of the discussion between Jesus and his disciples about forgiveness, right? And the question is asked, what if they don't repent? Well, Jesus gave instructions concerning that, right? And if your brother sins against you and, and go tell him his fault between you and him alone, if he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear you, in other words, he, he doesn't admit to his fault or doesn't accept his, his sin uh, or he is not penitent, Jesus said, do this. If he will not hear you, take with you one or two more. You want, you want to bring witnesses that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if that doesn't work, if they will not hear two or three others, Jesus says, if he will not hear you, I lost my place. Well, if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen, like a tax collector. In other words, if they're not penitent, right? If, if, if they're not willing to repent of their sins and you went through all this process, right? Jesus said, you, you have to treat them like a, like a heathen, like an outsider. And there's a purpose for that, right? Um, we looked at the example of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1 through 5, where there was someone in the church that was living in sin and the church in Corinth, they didn't, they didn't hold them accountable to the word of Christ. And so Paul writes them and say, you, you need to discipline this person. And eventually that's what they did. And we see in St. Corinthians that this person repented. It worked. What, what God said to do the process that Jesus explained, what Paul said to the church in Corinth to do worked. And the person repented of his sin and restored back into God's fold. Now, in 1 Corinthians 5, we see a purpose behind uh, the whole process. Number one, to help win this soul back to Christ. When someone sins, uh, and remember, this is in the relationship of brethren, right, of Christians, not someone who is out in the world. When someone sins, that person is lost, Right, and if if they refuse to give it up, then then they they'll be in a position of living in sin. So they're now lost. And so one of the purposes of going to them, of talking to them, taking the witnesses, telling it to the church, and then disciplining them, one of the main purposes is to win that soul back to Christ. Right, uh, you want them to be saved. The second purpose: uh, Why is it that if they don't repent? Why is it that the church has to discipline them? 
Why is it that they have to now be withdraw from, right, as we see in the scripture? Well, one of the, the second reason is so that the church remains pure, right? Uh, we cannot tolerate sin in the church. And what that means is you cannot tolerate sinful living in the church. And there's a difference between, and I mentioned this already, there's a difference between sinning and living in sin, right? Christians, we sin. We will. We're not perfect, right? But Christians cannot live in sin, right? And in other words, a Christian cannot make a habit of sin. It should not be a habit. Well, in the church in Corinth, this was a habit. Man was sleeping with his father's wife, and the church was not correcting him. All right, so we see the twofold purpose of this disciplinary effort. Number one, to help that person realize that they have strayed from the standards of Christ, to win them back uh, 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 to Jesus. And then number two, to ensure that this leaven doesn't leaven the whole lump, to ensure that the church remains pure. Now we looked at examples of where this point is communicated. Repentance is a prerequisite to forgiveness. Uh, that's one example in Corinth. The other example we look at was Jonah and the Ninevites. Right? God said to Jonah, go preach. Jonah said, no, those people are evil. Right? They deserve to be punished. And then Jonah runs away from going to preach to Nineveh. God said, no, you're not going anywhere. You Turns him around, right? If you would allow me to paraphrase the story, turns him around. Jonah comes to his senses. He goes to Nineveh and preaches. And what happened in Nineveh? They repented. And the Bible communicates us that God had, had plans to punish Nineveh, but because they repented, he forgave them, right? They gave, he gave them uh, another chance. Uh, another example of, of repentance that shows repentance is a prerequisite to forgiveness are the people at Pentecost. All right? That same group of people were the people that said of Jesus before Pilate, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And when Peter preached them the gospel, they realized, wow, we crucified Messiah. And so they asked, what shall we do? Peter says, Repent, right? Uh, before baptism, one must repent, right? If one doesn't repent before baptism, they're just getting wet, right? They're not baptized for the forgiveness of sins because there's no penitent, uh, there's no contrition there, right? And so we looked at, and there, these are three examples, but the entire Bible is filled with examples where God shows this to be the case that if I want forgiveness, I need to ask God for it. I need to be humble and penitent with contrition in my heart. Imagine if David never repented. He wouldn't be known as the man after God's own heart. And you know, all the evil that David did, right, took another man's wife, murdered the man, not just the man, but murdered all those who fought with that man in the front lines, right? And then, and then, you know, uh, and then, and then uh, Nathan the prophet comes to him and shows him his error, right? What if Nathan didn't have the courage to show the king his error, right? It was necessary for Nathan to tell David, "You are the man. You are the man," right? And then David comes to his senses. And we have the, the beautiful psalm, Psalm 51. That's a psalm of repentance. What if David never repented? All right. Well, we see this throughout the Bible. Uh, repentance is a prerequisite for forgiveness. Now, where we were last week is, is here. A Christian must always be ready and willing to forgive. All right. We cannot always be ready and willing to rebuke <laughs> and to say, you are in sin, right? We must also always be ready to forgive when that person says, 
you know what? You're right, brother. I, I did sin. Please forgive me. And we must always be willing to forgive. Notice again in our in our in our uh, initial text there of Luke 17, verse 3 and 4. Take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, you rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day returns saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. All right? But not just seven times, right? Eight times, nine times, however many times they come to you. You must always be willing to forgive. I know that question came up about, well, what if they seem like they're not penitent? <laughs> and that's the part where, that, that we leave that up to God, right? Uh, could, could, could someone show that they're not really penitent and they're not really sorry? Absolutely. There, there are ways you could, you could see that. But would that be the case all the time? We, we can never know. But what you can know is, did you truly forgive that person from the heart? Right? Did you truly forgive that person from the heart? Because if you don't forgive them when they seek your forgiveness, well, Jesus said this, right? For if you forgive men, uh, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men, their trespasses. Neither will your heavenly father forgive your trespasses. The apostle Paul also said something along the same line. You be kind to one another. He's writing to Christians, to the church in Ephesus. All right, so this is about Christian relationships. You be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. I want to ask you a question. Right. Were there any conditions to your forgiveness in Christ? Yes. All right. How did God in Christ forgive us? All right. And how did we receive that forgiveness when we obey that's the condition right when we obey the gospel then this will be true of us god in christ forgave you right it does not mean that god in christ forgave every single person it doesn't have this idea well god did it i don't have to do anything i'm forgiven already there are conditions, right? And in those conditions, when you obey the gospel, what, what must I do to obey the gospel? There's the first condition. You need to hear the gospel, right? You got to know what that is. What is the gospel? It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, right? The death, burial, and resurrection. What, what, what good is that to me? What good is that to you? Well, instead of us dying for our sins, someone else died for our sins. Instead of us living in the fear of death, which is our reality in our life, right? You live life long enough, you realize death is a certain part of life. It's certain, it's coming. But the gospel gives us that victory over death. Paul says that, but thanks be unto Christ who gives us the victory. Right? I know that I, one day I'm going to die, but I am not afraid of death anymore because I know I will live in Christ Jesus forever. All right? So you have the conditions. I'll, several hands have gone up. Let me finish the conditions here. You need to hear the gospel. You need to believe the gospel. You need to repent of your sins. You need to confess Jesus is the Son of God. You need to be baptized, washing away your sins. Only then will it be true of you and me, your father, uh, uh, that God in Christ also forgive you. Because that passage doesn't apply to those who don't obey, obey the gospel. Right? Um, some people use it to say, well, I mean, we don't have to do anything. God has done everything. He has forgiven us 
in Christ Jesus, but there's conditions. All right. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8 and 9 tells us that. That Jesus, he is the author of eternal salvation, not to everyone. That Jesus died for all, yes. But who is he the author of eternal salvation to? To all who obey him. All right. So that's the condition. All right. Um, I want to pause here. I'll go to Pat and then to Bobby. Was there another hand in the back there? All right. So, uh, so Pat and then Bobby. About forgiving a brother, would it be wise to forgive a brother that does the same thing against you? Yes. <laughs> right. Jesus said it, it, seven times he comes to you in that day. You forgive him. Um, I think we talked about this uh, uh, and I asked you a question. Have you ever made the same mistake before? Like, like you keep making the same mistake over and over. Have you ever done that in your life? Yeah. yeah. Right. Have you made the same mistake to the same person multiple times? Yes. Right. That will happen. All right. And there's a danger in that, right? Because you did this once to me. You're doing it again. And, and, and from there, you can, you can definitely venture into, I'm not sure if he's really penitent. All right. It's possible. But Jesus said, if they come to you and ask for forgiveness, it doesn't matter what. We forgive them. Now, I did mention, you have to also learn from that experience, right? I gave you an illustration. If I'm in business with a certain Christian, found out that he was stealing money from the business, and then I address him and he says, brother, I'm so sorry, I won't do it again. And then, uh, and then I'll give him another chance, all right? We'll stay in business. He does it again. I'll forgive him. But we're not going to be in business anymore. <laughs> I'm going to learn my lesson, all right? You forgive, but you got to learn from the experience, all right? Uh, so, so, yes, same sin multiple times. If they come to you seeking your forgiveness, God said, if you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven. All right. Um, Bobby? Okay, so I understand all that is forgiving and, and right? But you keep saying Christians, but I live in a real world with not everybody one Christian. Yes. So how do I deal with that? You, we're supposed to forgive, but because they're not Christians, what difference does it make if I forgive them or not if they're not Christian? And I'm not, I don't live in the church 24 hours a day, so you know what I mean? So do I forgive non-Christians and, and if they say they're sorry or just because, yes. because they're not Christians and everything you're telling me is we got to forgive Christians. We got to forgive our brotherhood Christians. You know, is it everybody God's people? And should I forgive everyone or just who I pick and choose because they belong in my church? They are, you know, my brotherhood in the church. Absolutely. So, so what you brought up is 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 definitely a, a different segment. Um, but by all means, we are to forgive others who are not uh, uh, part of the church. Could they fully understand uh, uh, the will of God? No. Are there situations in, in your encounter with people of the world that you turn the other cheek? Yes. Is that necessary? Absolutely. All right. If you notice what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 5, all right, when he wrote that letter to discipline that member of the church, all right, Paul says, I didn't write to you to remove yourselves from everyone who is sexually immoral. What he meant, what he's saying is, I didn't write to you to remove yourself from everyone, not just Christians, but from the, from the people that are not Christians that are sexually immoral. Paul said, I didn't write so you can remove yourself from them because then you have to be out of the earth in a sense, right? 
But he says, I wrote to remove yourself from a brother, a Christian who is sexually immoral. There's a standard that we hold each other accountable to that doesn't necessarily apply to those who are in the world, right? And that's literally what Paul emphasized there in 1 Corinthians 15, right? There, there are those who are in the world who are already living in sin. They're already judged by, by, by the law of righteousness. Those of us who are in the church, we have to hold each other accountable. Now, does forgiveness also apply to those outside of the world? Absolutely. Right? That's one of the ways you shine your light in Christ. When you show others that you are willing to forgive. Right? It's also one of the, your, or your avenues or, or your, your, one of your character, characteristics in being evangelistic. Is showing mercy. Is showing forgiveness. Right? So, so yes, it applies to the world. But here, here's the here here's the the difference, right? If someone sins against you in the world, right? Let's say they're a sinner; they don't know the standards of Christ. You cannot hold them to Matthew eighteen, fifteen, and seventeen, right? You cannot go to them and say, you know, hey, you sin against me, right? And if they refuse, you can't take two or three witnesses. And if they refuse to hear the two or three witnesses, you can't tell it to the church, right? So what I'm saying is you can't hold that person accountable to a law that they do not understand. They do not realize to a law that they have not submitted themselves to, right? And so in our encounters with the people of the world, always let it go, right? Always be willing to forgive, right? Always. In our encounter with Christians, always be willing to forgive, but don't dismiss the accountability, right? And that's sort of like what, what sometimes we forget. We let it go. We sweep it under the rug. There has to be accountability in God's people. Outside in the world, yes, I'll turn the other cheek. We're in traffic. You cut me off in traffic. I, I'm not going to chase you down and, and say, you cut me off in traffic, brah. <laughs> right? I'm not going to do that. Right? I'll let that go. Right? Uh, and you, you can apply that in, in any, any scenario in your encounter with people that do not know Christ yet. Right? And so, so understanding that, that's why we're emphasizing a relationship between us first. We want to understand that first. Uh, in our relationship with the world, you want to be the light of Christ. You want to show God, uh, show the people that yeah, I'm a I'm a I'm a Christian, and I I'm willing to forgive and suffer what wrong you're going to do to me. Uh, would that apply in your relationship with your Christian brethren? Yes, but don't dismiss the accountability because they need it and we need it, right? What happens um, uh, coming into the church now, right? What happens if I'm living in sin and I don't realize it and no one warns me? I'll be lost. All right? There's a song that we sing. It goes, you never mention him to me. All right? You met me day by day. You knew I was astray. You never mention him to me. Have you ever thought about that song in light of the Christian, right? That song is sang. We sing that song in light of the people that are lost, that we know that maybe we don't have the courage to tell them about Jesus. They're lost, but we're not telling them. And so that song is sung from that perspective. You never mentioned him to me. You met, you met me day by day. You knew I was astray. You never mentioned him to me. What, what if it's a Christian? You never mentioned that I was living in sin. Can a Christian be blind living in sin? Yes. I'll tell you, a um, certain, certain preacher that, that, uh, <laughs> that uh, he, he had influenced a lot of my thinking in, in, in his writing. Uh, gifted writer. I uh, love reading his articles. 
you probably read his blog before. And this man, uh, uh, he, he completely turned on the doctrine of Christ. Completely. Cheated, cheated on his wife. Uh, put her through misery in, in, in court. Made all these demands. And, and just not long ago, found out he married again. Right. He's in a he's in an adulterous relationship, right. and and many have counseled, many have reached out uh, to to this man. He's just blinded by love or by lust, if you will. Or right. a Christian can be blind, and that's why what Jesus taught here, accountability. That's why it matters. Because we want to help each other make it to heaven. Sometimes when someone sins against us, we might, we might be more willing to say, I hope they get what they deserve. Then we are facing them and, and helping them realize, you know, their sin and winning them back to Christ. We have a brother here that have his hand up. Go ahead. Uh, we'll bring the mic to you. Uh, for our visitors, the reason why we use the mic, we have Zoomers zooming in. So... We want them to hear the other side of, of the conversation. Um, uh, in the uh, the lovely Tano shirt there. <laughs> I, I don't want to be redundant because after I really my, Ray, rose my hand or raised my hand, you actually said what I was going to say. And, and, and again, it goes to the title of your lesson there. A Christian must always be ready and willing to forgive, whether, you're, whether it's in the church or outside the church. It's having a forgiving heart. Yes. And, um, you know, you, you reiterated that. And repentance is simply changing focus. It's changing what you focus on in your life. You know, from once where you focused on things that were kept you away from God, you focus on things that now brings you closer to God. You turn, and that's what repentance is. But, again, I don't want to be redundant. You've already re said everything. Thank you. Appreciate that. I, I'm very redundant. <laughs> and, the, and uh our christian family here they they have suffered kindly with me <laughs> or, or 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 uh not with me but <laughs> with my redundancy <laughs> um was there another hand go ahead Brent. yeah um in dealing with those people who who done wrong with us oh please excuse my english i can <laughs> i hope i can make this uh, uh clear uh, in, in dealing with those people who are who done wrong with us is not just simply forgive just what is our topic as uh, repentance should be there and but how, how can we make them repent and uh, a, a verse that I found is necessary for us to understand you, we 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 should not uh, just accept what the wrong and that's it Jesus in the uh, in the book of John 18, here is a verse. But when he said this one of the officers who was standing nearby, struck Jesus saying, is that the way you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him. If I have spoken wrongly, testify of the wrong. But if rightly, why do you strike me? So we, we should, what, what I mean in this verse is that we should not just allow people to do wrong uh, against us. Uh, the best way to handle this one is to ask, what did I do wrong? And if it is uh, worthy of slapping you, then be it, turn the other way also. And that's what it means when the, the verse says, if someone strike you on the right cheek, turn him on the left cause as well. <laughs> and in that verse, I've been in a Bible class and uh, I wanted to know what that means is in those days or even in these days, most people are right-handed. So if you slap a person, it should be on your left cheek. Yeah, Someone slap you directly to your left cheek. But in those times, uh, in, in those times, uh, Jesus' times, Jesus mentioned right cheek first. That means the one that slaps you is a right hand but it was slapped by the back end. And that way, 
that is the way in, in or custom in that in those days receiving a slap because you done wrong so if you done wrong they slap you with a backhand by the right so it will be you will be slapped on your right and that means you done wrong so just to uh, just to suffice the anger of the one you done wrong you turn him also to the left and that's that's what i heard from one bible class that was very accurate um the slap was an insult in their in in their days in, in that culture um uh i do want to add to to uh what ren was saying cuz cuz we did cover cover this song that a christian is not a doormat for people to just walk all over all right uh we i have deal with um uh some homeless individuals that have come here and try to sleep at the building all right and you know i will kindly say i'm i'm so sorry you, you cannot sleep in the stairway of our building and you know what they say almost most of the time i thought you were a christian all right like like you're supposed to 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 just you know oh i right, just go ahead and and sleep right there in the building um you're not supposed to just suffer all the wrongs. Right? That, that's not right. right. There's some wrongs you suffer. Uh, but like Ren says, you, you got to correct, uh, um, be willing to stand up to wrongdoing. Right? Like Jesus said uh, in the passage that, um, that, that Ren brought up. And also Ren mentioned, like, how, how can you lead someone to repentance? Right? Maybe something practical that you can do. Uh, something I've done, I've done before. Um, a meal invitation, right? A meal invitation is is a great avenue for having that type of dis discussion. Invite them to lunch. Uh, take them out. Go eat, and then lovingly talk to them about the situation, because if you don't approach it right. It makes the situation worse, right? Paul said, I'll come to Andrews. Paul said in Galatians 6 and verse uh, 1 and verse 2, if you notice that with me, there's a certain attitude about us that we need to have in order for us to win that soul to Christ, all right? Uh, Paul says there, brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, then he says, you who are spiritual, Restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted, right? Why did he have to bring that up? Considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. In our approach to correct someone, there's that temptation, right? There's the temptation of coming off as holier than thou there's a temptation of you know of of looking down on them uh, uh you know looking down people uh, uh from your nose he, here's a here's the approach how how can i you know someone offended me how how can i lead them to repentance take them out to lunch All right take them out on a meal invitation have that conversation it's you're doing it by the way Jesus said it, right? Go to him first, right? A meal invitation is one of the best things you can do to reconcile, to help reconcile someone uh, back to Jesus. And so just to give us something practical we can do. So remember the, the approach in the spirit of gentleness and meekness, always being weary of how you are doing it. Be weary of yourself. Are you are you are you about to lose control? <laughs> right? Are you about to lose composure? Because if you do, then the, then that effort won't lead to to the goal or the end game. Is there another hand? Andres, yes. Oh, Mika. Okay, go ahead, Mika. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Paul Lima. I guess uh, what I heard 
was well explained about the subject that was in, in discussing. But my question is different from what we <laughs> discuss. In Matthew chapter 6, as you said, verse 14 to 15, you was referring what Jesus was saying. He is referring to the church. Those who have been forgiven, they cannot be forgiven if they don't forgive others. Because concerning that, uh, that text, Jesus was telling the people under the Old Testament in the book of Matthew, under the old law or under the, the, the people who were uh, worshiping in the temple. And plus, his disciples were there. That was before the church began. I wanted you to elaborate what you said about that verse is, you know, it's for the church. I can understand also, but I guess people are sometimes confused when we say those kind of things, when they understand what the texts are. So that's what I'm asking for them. Are you talking about the conditions and which is very true and very right? Please, can you elaborate that, please, for us? Um, let me let me see if I um, um, understand the the the, the question. Um, you want me to elaborate on Matthew six fourteen and fifteen as it pertains to the church or? The church, not to the world, not to the world, because he mentioned the, the forgiveness and the transpasses, and he told the people, you know, if you don't forgive, and it doesn't apply to the world, because God will not forgive them before, after, you know, or before they their sins are forgiven, right? Okay, yes. That's, that's what you meant. Okay, thank you, brother. Yes. Yeah, so, so again, um, um, uh, it's kind of similar to what uh, Bobby brought up about, you know, we live in the world, right? And and uh, how forgiveness, as as our visiting brother brought up, we're always be willing uh, and ready to forgive everyone. Right? But when we look at the teachings of, of Jesus here, specifically the Sermon on the Mountain, he was addressing the people, right? God's people, uh, contextually the Jews, but then this, this entire sermon also applies to the kingdom, the church. Because um, uh, if, you, if you go back uh, in, in verse uh, uh, 3 of Matthew 5, right? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God, right? And so, yes, contextually, he was talking to God's people, the Jews. It also applies to Christians, but a lot of these principles that are taught here, uh, yes, they, the, this forgiveness is not of those. Uh, um, it doesn't apply to, the, to those who are in the world who have no intention to be in relationship with God. Right? Uh, similar to what Paul said to the church in Corinth when he said, I wrote to you in the epistle that you should not keep company with the sexually immoral. And then he clarified, not the sexually immoral of the world, uh, because then you need to be out of the world, but, the, but a brother or a Christian who, who is sexually immoral, don't keep company with them, right? And so uh, just understanding that about uh, the nature of our, our class, right? Um, the main principle, does, would this apply to the world? Repentance is a prerequisite for forgiveness. It, it applies to one who will seek God. If they seek God, there's God demands repentance if they want to be forgiven, right? But our main emphasis is, is our relationships as brethren in Christ and the accountability that we should have uh, within the church, holding one another accountable to the law of Christ, 
All right. And so, um, Andres, you have your hand up? Yeah. Uh, I just want to put another perspective in this whole uh, concept with uh, forgiveness because it always involves somebody doing something wrong, you know? And for any sin, there are consequences. So there's the moral sin that we talked about where uh, the, the father is uh, sleeping with his wife and so forth. So there's that moral sin, yeah. But there is also uh, consequences for uh, sins of this world. As you mentioned, if someone cheats you and steals money from you, there's a consequence and laws for that. So if someone is constantly doing something wrong to you, trying to rip you off, or doing something wrong, you can call the police and justice will be done in earthly terms, in terms of the earthly law. So if someone is doing something wrong to you, you can't just be a doormat. You need to change that behavior and do something about it. You can forgive that person, but I, as I mentioned, there are consequences. Yeah. You know? And as for the person that cut you off on the freeway, and you know that was you know something wrong and so forth, but There'll be a consequence for that because as we all know, like you said, when we die, all of our sins will be accounted for. Yeah. yeah. And all of the things that eventually we did wrong, we're going to have to account for that. And Jesus will speak for us. Yeah. But yeah, so we can't just be a doormat. Uh, there are consequences and uh, we can't let people cheat us or, or rip us off or do crimes to us and so forth. Uh, there is earthly justice that can uh, take over for that. Thank you. Yes. Um, I don't want to start a, a political discussion here, but um, uh, there, there, when it comes to uh, guns, that's one, my, when it comes to guns, there are Christians that go to the extremes on both sides. Some will say, a Christian cannot own a gun, all right? And, and that would be one extreme, and that would be uh, uh, not true. <laughs> and then there's the other extreme of, of like, you know, uh, uh, of being someone who, who, who lavishes in, you know, in that, in that lifestyle of, uh, of um, gun ownership, uh, to the extreme, if you will. And, and so uh, I said that to say this. If someone comes to your house, all right, um, and threatens the life of your family, all right, are you going to just let them do that to your family? Absolutely not, right? Well, I will tell you, there are Christians who will say, turn the other cheek. And what they mean is, is that, that you be a doormat, a uh, doormat to, to wrongdoing. No, right? It's, it's right to defend yourself. It's right, it's right to protect yourself, right? And, and so... Um, what Andrew said about the law. Why do we have laws? Well, God said that the government is there as his servant to punish evil and to maintain good. All right. Um, can someone be forgiven but still suffer the consequences of their actions? Yes. All right. Um, God forbid that this happens, but if 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 someone if someone kills one of my child, they could be forgiven. But by all means, I will press charges, <laughs> and by all means, I I will uh, make sure that the the full extent of the law will come down on them, uh, because it's not just about forgiveness. It's also about the lesson, or it's also about accountability, right? Uh, so many instances, uh, and and some are right, some are kind of extreme. So many instances of of uh, you see in the court of law, of parents saying to the suspect, 
who took their child's life, I forgive you. Right? And you look at the suspect, they're not penitent. They're smiling. There, I mentioned the, the example of, of one of the uh, one man, his daughter was, along with other women, were brutally murdered by this serial killer. And the father in the court, he was looking at him and he says, and says in front of the judge, I forgive this fool. All right. But when he looked over to the man, he was laughing. He was smiling. He was, he was, he wasn't penitent. And this father lost it. He jumped over and tried to choke him to death. All right. And, and so, and there are cases where like, um, uh, the brother in Christ that was shot in his apartment by the police officer in Dallas, uh, Brother Bingham, right? And how his brother said to the officer, I forgive you, right? And he, he asked the judge, can I give her a hug? Because clearly he, he could see the, the, the police officer. She was overwhelmed with emotion. She was crying. Right? And, and Bingham's brother was given the opportunity. He hugged her and he said, I forgive you. Right? So there are a lot of situations like that in the world where forgiveness is offered and the suspect, if you will, is not penitent uh, or forgiveness is offered. And you can clearly see that they are penitent. What Andrew says is true. Our, our job is to be ready and willing to forgive. The other stuff, that's God. Because the reality is, at the end of the day, we will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Right? We will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And each of us will receive according to what we have done. And I'd rather be on the side of the merciful <laughs> Uh, uh, then on the side of judgment, all right? And, and James says something about that. Mercy triumphs over judgment, right? And, and so when you think about that, you, you want to be a forgiving person. Right? You want to be a merciful person. Uh, you, you, and, 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 that, and that you can do while also practicing the accountability that, that we should have in the laws of Christ. Uh, Bobby? So what I was getting to is we forgive everybody, okay? But we hold our brethren in church to a higher standard. But we forgive my neighbor, and I'm not holding him where he got to repent to me that he committed a sin to me or whatever, or, or anybody that does sin that is not within my church, my home. So we, we hold each other in here accountable for what we do, but everybody else, we just forgive. That, that's what I'm hearing, and that's what I understand. That was the question of bringing up was, should we forgive everybody, even if they're not Christians, even if they're not in my church? Not all about this, this, this you know. The world will, the world will punish whoever they got to punish. Mm -hmm. God has us within the church, within our brethren. So we just forgive everybody outside. But if, say, Rick sinned against me, now I'm waiting for some type of... Uh, penitence for Rick because he is my brother and he's my brother in Christ right that's what you say so let me let me walk this back a little bit right God is the God of all the universe everyone will be held accountable to God's law, everyone, right? And so um, in regards to our discussion on forgiveness, yes, 
you are to be willing to forgive men their trespasses. Right? Jesus didn't say Christians only. <laughs> he said you'll be willing to forgive men their trespasses. Right? But also Jesus showed that there's a standard within the church that the church must uphold. Right? Because we are to be the light of the world. Right. And so that 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 standard, we must hold each other accountable to it with a purpose. One, to win one another back to Christ when we stray. Two, to ensure the purity of the church, right? That sin doesn't spread in the church because it will affect the church. Right. And so um that's why I mentioned and uh um uh, uh, in the beginning, that what we're these passages we're dealing with, let's first apply it here in the church because these are instructions to us, right? But do they apply also in other relationships we have? Absolutely. The only thing is, you be aware of the of the reality that some people out there are are just not willing to submit to the law of God. Right. And so so that's why I mentioned you cannot take two or three witnesses to someone who doesn't believe in Christ. Right. You just forgive them and move on. All right. And maybe help try to win them to Christ. But you just can't hold them to a standard they have not submitted themselves to. Why is it that we are to hold one another to the standard? Because we have willingly said. We will follow Jesus. That's what we said. When we obeyed the gospel, we said, I'm following Jesus. And that means I follow his examples. I follow his teachings. I do everything that I'm commanded of by Jesus. And when you say you're following Jesus too, it encourages me. And this idea of forgiving one another, you know where it's supposed to be easy? It's supposed to be easy in the church because we have submitted ourselves to the Lord. That's where it's supposed to happen. And it's, it's supposed to be easy, right? But you know what makes it hard? When we just say we follow Jesus, but don't practice his commandments. That makes it hard. That makes it awkward to go to one another and say, brother, you've sinned. If someone is truly submitting to Christ, when they realize they are in sin, you know what they'll do 100% of the time? Repent. And so the, the laws that, that God's given to us, this, this, this can be a counterpoint to my sermon this morning, but the, the laws that were given to us makes living on this side of eternity easy, if I could say that, right? Uh, Paul, or not Paul, but John said it this way, right? By this we know that we love God and that, that we love the children of God and that we love God if we keep his commandments. And then he says, and his commandments are not burdensome. You take what the Bible says about how to live your life, you avoid a lot of the troubles in the world, right? Uh you know, uh, the advice that God gives in the Bible, it does make life easy. Now, does, the Christ, does that mean the Christian life is easy? No, more to that in our sermon this morning, right? The reason why the Christian life is not easy because you are not living in the Christian world. You're outnumbered by the, a world that is counter-Christian a world that is anti-Christ. That's why it makes it hard. Jesus walked in that world. Look what they did to him. Killed him. Right? And so, so yes, the, um, um, when I walked it back, we're all going to answer God, whether you're a believer or not. Right? But you want to stand before God covered by the blood of Jesus. Because that's where his mercy is, the blood of his son. You don't want to stand before God without the blood of Jesus. Because we know the end of that.
And I'll go to bed. So I just want to back up to gun ownership. There's only one purpose of having a gun. Say that again, sir. Gun ownership. There's, oh. only, there's only one purpose to owning a gun, right? And it's not to protect yourself because that's why we have a relationship with God because God said, I kill, right? Yeah. And what does the gun do? It kills. There's only one purpose for that. So if we follow the scriptures as it is written and we believe in our heart, right? Probably you're not going to, you're not going to own a gun because there's only one sole purpose. And to say that I own a gun to protect the four corners of my property, that's of this world. That's materialistic things. That's not what the scripture says, you know? And I just talking about my personal experience of owning guns and what the results came out of that. Yeah. You know, well, I appreciate you sharing your, your experience. Uh, um, I disagree with, with the concept of, of uh, uh, well, what are you going to do with the gun? Go shoot rabbits? Yeah. <laughs> really? Right. So, so he, he, let, me, let me take hold of this before we have a politically incorrect discussion. All right. Um, I'm no uh, a brethren that use guns and the only thing they use it for was to hunt food. I come deer. from generations of hunters. So you know that, right? Yes. So but so that's but that's my heritage of growing up and having respect for the gun as well as I have respect for the scriptures. Yes. But in today's world, someone owning a gun is all for the wrong purpose. So not true, not true. Well, um, there but, was but a you point. you talked about if somebody comes into your house, you're going to use the gun to protect yourself and your family. Oh. I don't own a gun. I, I own uh, two guns. <laughs> but <laughs> um, but, but uh, there was a point in the ministry of the disciples where Jesus told them to take a sword. No, no, well, okay, okay. All right, so we're not going to go into this. Obviously, this, this is going to be a heated discussion, right? And we're not going to do that today. But Jesus did allow his disciples to take a sword because the, the roads they travel were often filled with beasts, were often dangerous, and he allowed them to take it. And he said, and, 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 and they, they actually said it to him. And Jesus said, that's enough, all right? All right, yeah, well, I want to say this because this has been heard. It's not wrong to own a gun, all right? And Rick, I want to say that uh, here uh, because you misspoke there. Uh, it's not wrong to own a gun, all right? Um, what I'm not trying to talk about today is the political stuff that surrounds gun ownership. And I don't want us to talk about that today, right? So, so uh, yeah, we'll pause right there, <laughs> right? Before this class uh, spirals into a discussion and not, not really spiritually focused. Go ahead. For the other person. Forgiveness is not for the person who has wronged you. Forgiveness is for you. Because if you don't have a heart of forgiveness that you've been speaking of this morning, regardless of what the circumstances may be and what you may encounter, if you don't have a heart of forgiveness for your fellow man in whatever relationship that may be, then it takes, then, then hate takes root. Then hate in your heart takes root. That's kind of like the straight up uh, part of not forgiving someone. And some people are not willing to have that hate stay in their heart. God teaches us about forgiveness. He teaches us about forgiveness. It's not only a commandment, but he understands what is necessary for us to have peace in our life. 
and that is to have a forgiving heart. So the forgiveness is not for the person who has wronged you. It is for you to heal. It is for you to understand who your God is. It is not Satan. It is not this world. It is the Father that has sent his son for us, who died in showing forgiveness. Thank you for sharing that. I, I will add, I will add to this that that forgiveness is for both, right? It is for the person you're forgiving because. Because um, when God forgave us, it wasn't just for him. It was for us. It's to show us that I can have a second chance, right? And so when you extend that to that person, the same way God extended to us, it blesses that person too. But you're absolutely right in, in that if we're not willing to forgive, bitterness takes root. And then and, and, um, it, it makes relationships uh, sad and awkward in a lot of ways. Uh, but let's close with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your word. And we're, we're so thankful, Father, for your forgiveness. When we wrong, Lord, we came to the cross to, to seek your mercy. And we're so thankful for extending it through your son, Jesus. And so, Father, help us to be likewise as your children, to extend the mercy and the grace of forgiveness to those who, who, who need it, to those who have wronged us. For we know, Father, if we do not forgive, we will not be forgiven. Be with us now, Father, as we prepare to worship you in spirit and in truth. Clear our hearts and our minds of what's in this world and Help us, Lord, to focus on you, your son, and your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.